Welcome everyone to the 2020 AFTO Virtual Conference. We regret that for the first time in 124 years we have not been able to come together in person, but given the events the last three months and the current events in Phoenix where we had planned to meet this week, it seems canceling the in-person conference was a good decision. We're very excited. We have over 1,200 individuals registered for today's event. Uh, this event is being recorded and the recording will be made available to all participants later this week. If you have questions throughout the presentation today, please type them into the Q&A window and we will uh, ask those questions at the end of the presentations. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Our first speaker today is Ernest Julian, PhD. He has served as the Chief of the Center of Food Protection for the Rhode Island Department of Health for the last 29 years. Prior to this, he was with the Connecticut Department of Health for 14 years. He has served as AFTA's representatives in the Council to Improve Foodborne Outbreak Response, or C4, and CDC Business Surveillance Workgroup. He is co-author of the C4 Guidelines and a lead instructor for Louisiana State University's Managing Food Emergencies course. He is also an adjunct assistant professor at Brown University. He is the recipient of the Wiley Award and the AFTOS President's Award, and the FDA Commissioner's Special Citation, and CDC and ATSDR's Honor Award. He is a tireless champion for reducing foodborne illness. Ernie has served as the AFTO President for the past year and is concluding his term today. Please join me in welcoming President Ernie Julian. Good afternoon. Um, when I started a year ago, um, one of the slides I used is the one that's up on the screen, making a difference, focus on what will have the greatest impact in reducing deaths, long-term disabilities and illnesses. Um, at the time, I was thinking foodborne illnesses, and yet the last five months, we spent uh, almost full time on COVID and COVID-19. So the world has changed, uh, obviously, tremendously in a very few months. And let's see, for some reason, the slide, there we go. All right, so the initial focus when we started, and day one, we uh, worked with NASDA, the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, uh, to join with them on the FDA produce grant. You know, there've been lots of outbreaks, obviously, associated with leafy greens and other produce. And uh, we work with them, uh, we're co-funded with FDA, and we've hired Brenda Morris to run that program. Um, in the fall, we also put together a webinar with Dr. Aaron Hall and Dr. Laura Brown from CDC on norovirus, the major cause of foodborne illness, to address that. There were lots of outbreaks uh, associated with hepatitis A in the state, so we conducted a webinar to deal with that. Um, dealing with salmonellosis, we've had several calls with Pew Charitable Trust, CDC, FDA, USDA, industry, a call as recent as last week to uh, come up with a plan to deal with that. Uh, antibiotic resistance uh, is a major concern. We had calls with CDC, FDA, and the Association of Animal Feed Control Officials to look at what's the potential for feed, uh, animal feed being the source of um, antibiotic resistance in people. And we jumped an extra slide here. Um, with the, I serve on the FISMA surveillance uh, work group with CDC. And one of the things that that group does is provide recommendations to the Secretary for your Health and Human Services on how to improve uh, foodborne outbreak investigations. And, and that group uh, uh, recommendations in the past have helped increase funding to CDC and to the states. Uh, also worked with the Council to Improve Foodborne Outbreak Response and updating the guidelines. And the third edition of the guidelines was just released. So those are some of the things that have been going on. Uh, but one of the things in looking at the data, we saw that foodborne illnesses have actually increased. A number of them have increased and not decreased. And we kept having outbreaks in the same places, and especially with leafy greens. Uh, so to address that issue, one of the things that we looked at was we really need a meeting of all the stakeholders. We wanted the scientists, the people who could think out of the box, and the leaders who can make things happen. We pulled together 133 uh, stakeholders from federal, state, and local government. Uh, from the health side, food regulatory side, from epidemiology, from the labs, uh, professional associations, consumer groups, academia, the Centers for Excellence, and industry from farm to table. And in January the 7th through the 9th, we had a conference, the Roadmap to Foodborne Illness Reduction via Healthy People 2030. Uh, to market that uh, and get an industry buy-in, um, obviously to get legislative buy-in too, reducing foodborne illnesses long-term disabilities helps reduce healthcare costs. And that's obviously on a lot of people's minds in state legislatures and, and also at the federal level. Uh, on the industry benefit side, 
Uh, nobody wants what happened with spinach where you shut down an entire industry or tomatoes or peanut butter or romaine lettuce where you end up shutting down entire sectors uh, of the economy. Uh, recurring recalls, lawsuits and lost sales are obviously um, motivations for the industry to, to help us and, and everybody wants to do the right thing in reducing foodborne illness. So why do we use Healthy People 2030? Well, it gives us a long-term focus. Uh, the national objectives also focus on the pathogens of greatest concern. It focuses on the foods and factors most often associated with illness. And it helps us develop short, mid, and long-range plan to achieve illness reduction. So one of the things that's happened, though, is it's hard to look at illness trends right now because the testing has changed. So now instead of cultures, you know, have culture-independent diagnostic tests. These really short, uh, you can get um, results often in hours. Um, we're finding with these new tests that all of a sudden there are increases in Campylobacter, Salmonella, E. coli, Yersinia, Cyclospora, and we're also seeing an increase in co-infections. There was about a 30% increase in co-infections. So somebody all of a sudden you find they have Salmonella and Campylobacter. So to what extent are these increases due to changes in testing? You know, and that's still um, open for a lot of debate. So if illnesses aren't going down, one of the quotes that I've always liked, and it's attributed to Einstein, but also to others, but insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So if illnesses aren't going down, what is it we should be doing different? What can make an impact in reducing these illnesses? So at the conference, we focused on the pathogens of greatest concern that were identified in Healthy People 2030. We, we had breakouts on E. coli, on Salmonella and Campylobacter, on Listeria, and on norovirus. And then the second day, we broke it in by sector of the economy to involve industry to the greatest extent possible. And we focused on produce, on beef and dairy, on poultry, and on retail and food service. So uh, in charging the groups, one of the things that we said is, well, we've got these recurring outbreaks, leafy greens and, and from other foods and, and other sectors of the economy and from other establishments. And the greatest predictor of the future is the past. And I always hated history until I learned that and that those that failed to uh, to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And we've seen that with leafy greens. You've got 30 plus outbreaks since 2009. In Yuma, Arizona, we found contaminated irrigation water uh, basically next to 100,000 cattle, and that water was being sprayed on lettuce. There's obviously a major problem there. Uh, there's also opportunities. Whole genome sequencing obviously now gives us the ability to detect small and recurring outbreaks and find and eliminate the root cause. With the E. coli breakout group, one of the slides showed that uh, if you looked at different foods uh, associated with illnesses, over 90% of E. coli 15787 was either associated with cattle or produce, different types of produce. And irrigation water keeps coming up. Obviously, uh, if you get cattle nearby, contamination from manure, use of manure as fertilizer, those are all major potential sources of contamination. And to prevent recurring outbreaks in those settings, one of the things that was discussed was requiring water treatment if an outbreak is from contaminated water. On the farmer side, uh, we looked at what different sectors of the economy could do. Obviously, having safe irrigation water and processing water is, is key for ready-to-eat foods. Uh, safe handling of manure is key. Um, vaccination was discussed a lot, uh, and we had a call on that last week with a couple of vaccine companies. And vaccine companies right now, we're all obviously trying to put out vaccines for COVID-19. But once that's down uh, and under control, hopefully in a couple of years, uh, the intent is to try and get some vaccines for Salmonella intraviditis, some other frequent serotypes of Salmonella for Campylobacter and for STEC. Uh, trace back, a lot of time spent on that. You know, we shouldn't have to shut down the whole sectors of an economy because we can't find the source. And that's been a problem in the past with tomatoes. It's been a problem with leafy greens. So finding a better way to find the source and, and get to that particular farm and or establishment and not shut down a whole sector of the economy. You know, Frank Yannis has talked a lot about blockchain as a tool to give us more rapid means for, for finding the source. On the meat side, uh, USDA is talking about the grinding logs, you know, finding uh, what particular establishment, you know, hamburger came from so they can address it properly. On the norovirus prevention uh, breakout group, uh, Dr. Hall and uh, Laura Brown, basically um, major issues that came out of there was requiring a certified manager. CDC research has shown if you have a certified manager, you're less likely to have an outbreak. 
Excluding food employees, obviously, is a major issue with norovirus and people with vomiting and diarrhea, getting them out of the place. Sick time for employees so they can make up the time is, is obviously critical. And we've seen that same thing with COVID recently, that you've got sick people working and causing lots of people to become ill. No hand contact to ready foods is an important control measure. Excellent hand washing. A vomitous cleanup procedure. You know, you don't have people cleaning it up and basically causing more contamination throughout the facility. And then there was also discussion that there's uh, work uh, on a neural vaccine. But again, I'm sure that's been uh, probably sidetracked at the present time with uh, COVID-19 concerns. One of the slides that Dr. Hall put up, and this was from 2016, but it looked at four key control measures for uh, norovirus, and that if these were implemented, he said that millions of cases of norovirus could be prevented. And the four controls were prohibition of bare hand contact, uh, certified food managers, exclusion of food workers, and contamination event response plan. You've got a procedure for cleaning up a, a vomitous incident. Uh, somebody vomits in the place, you've got a procedure for cleaning that up. And the blue are obviously the states that have adopted controls in those areas, and the white are, are states that don't have controls in those areas. So you can see that there's, again, this is 2016, but there's uh, room for improvement. On the food service side, uh, again, similar control measures, certified managers, trained staff, sick time for employees so they can make up the time, no bare hand contact, purchase from safe sources, and have a system in place to assure food safety and verify it works. Common themes from the breakouts were collaboration. Obviously working together is absolutely crucial. Action, um, pushing, doing things now. You know, while research is needed, it's, it's we don't need to wait for years on some things that we know can be effective at this point in time. Uh, Follow-up is essential to keep it from happening again, and that's much higher priority than routine inspections. And, and we see that, you know, federal, state, and local level legislators want to see all places that inspected at a certain frequency, but that obviously isn't good public health. We, want, we need to spend our time on where the problems are greatest and make sure that serious problems are followed up and, and eliminated versus getting to uh, all places at the same frequency where, when some of them are low risk. Common themes, making data available to drive action, linking epi and environmental data to find and eliminate sources of illness, taking immediate action to prevent additional illnesses when those links occur, promoting awareness of FDA, USDA, state and local inspection data for industry and for consumer buyers to drive corrective actions. Again, give people knowledge so that they can make appropriate decisions. Evaluation. Metrics, uh, choosing them uh, wisely is important or can actually drive uh, an ineffective program. And I mentioned previously about inspection numbers and frequency mandates can sometimes, uh, I've seen nationally and I've been doing this for 45 years now that some places, oh, we've got to get to these places and meet our inspection or our frequency of inspections and they're not doing re-inspections which are a much higher priority or they're not following up on a place with an outbreak. You know, making it clear to the uh, legislators, um, you know, what the clear priorities are. And, and the priorities in our metrics need to be what's going to reduce illness, reduce food disposals, the frequency of foodborne illness risk factors, and putting systems in place to prevent recurring outbreaks and serious hazards to health. I mean, those are obviously our, our clear priorities. Um, some policy issues that were discussed and brought up, improving food safety is obviously huge, reducing contamination from cow and poultry manure, and improving safety of irrigation and wash water. Those have high economic cost. Uh, but they're also um, high causes of illness. And that's come up repeatedly with, where you see uh, cow manure or chicken manure contaminating irrigation water and all of a sudden contaminating a large amount of crops. Vaccine research and implementation to reduce salmonella and camping the back from poultry and estet from cattle. Um, legislation to look at sick time for employees or employees can make up their time to prevent norovirus and other illnesses. Uh, whole genome sequencing uh, has been discussed repeatedly as a game changer, but funding is needed at the lab, at the and food regulatory level to investigate clusters and find and eliminate sources of contamination. We're finding a lot more clusters, but somebody needs to follow up on those, obviously. Funding metagenomics. You no longer have cultures to uh, basically grow salmonella and campylobacter and these other things. So new technologies to um, use uh, genomes to basically uh, identify particular uh, organisms. 
with uh, the congressional groups, we also worked with uh, consumer groups to advocate for increased funding to FDA, CDC, and the states. Research needs, um, safe irrigation and water treatment practices were brought up. Evaluate and uh, develop effective micro kill steps for produce, looking at chlorine, ozone, irradiation, how antibiotic resistant organisms get into livestock and into people. Uh, ID the top salmonella serotypes of concern for vaccine development. Uh, it was discussed that salmonella typhonurium has gone down considerably. And one of the uh, things that was attributed to was, you know, vaccines were being done. Uh, it was discussed that in Europe, uh, salmonella has gone down and vaccines are, are being used more. So looking at that as a way of reducing illnesses. So developing vaccines for norovirus for people and salmonella can't be an estic for animals was discussed. Uh, Campylobacter causation, you know, that's a major cause of foodborne illness. Why? Uh, cyclospore, raw milk, how do we reduce consumption? And virulence factors, where should we spend our time? Uh, what's most likely to cause illness? Other research needs, behavior change and root cause analysis, looking at the behavioral side. Uh, we need a place to publish research because it's currently all over the place. And you need one single place to go to find this research information. With salmonella, the ability to distinguish and characterize which are more pathogenic in a rapid format, and effective interventions at retail. So these are all research needs that were identified. On the education side, there was uh, discussions of the need for education for the public and for industry to prevent outbreaks, increasing educational materials to industry, consumer education uh, and what to do in the homes, uh, education and the funding we request and receive, and instill a culture of prevention. Uh, conference for food, food protection, some issues were brought up to do with there and uh, the conference because of COVID has been pushed off for a year, but some, uh, some things to discuss there and promote, increase the number of establishments with well-developed and implemented food safety management systems, uh, including well-documented employee health program, increase establishments with certified manager, increase establishments with trained staff, and access to food purchase information. Uh, we need food purchase information quickly when we're doing investigations so we can find and eliminate the source quickly. Other retail actions, promote adoption of the latest version of the food code, increased implementation of food management systems, and there's some templates that are out there, increase the number of establishments with certified managers. Uh, 14 states didn't have it as a requirement, getting that in place there to uh, increase the potential for reducing foodborne illness, increase in the number of establishments with trained workers. Some 2020 priority objectives, prevent recurring leafy green outbreaks. And, and I pulled from basically all the groups and putting this together. Uh, assure preventive actions taken at implicated farms. Uh, buyers require audits of high risk suppliers. You get the Food Marketing Institute guidance document, which is out there for stores to buy safe produce, a uh, well, well written document. Uh, prevent contamination from manure, assure safe irrigation water, and regulatory action to prevent adulterated food from entering commerce. Environmental assessments during the harvest season on the following year so that you can see what went on. Typically when we're out at the produce fields or FDA or the state is out there, it's after the fact and half the time or majority of the time the field's been plowed under so you don't see what happened. So doing, uh, getting out there next year at the same time to see, well, all right, what led to the outbreak? Because we keep finding outbreaks occurring from the same places. Industry and government sampling at the time of harvest and from sources of illness at the same time of exposure um, last year. So in research, there's something called the Hawthorne effect. And sometimes just the fact that you're sampling and, and looking at something can cause change. And here, the fact that you're picking up samples can sometimes drive buyers to say, oh, you know, I, I need to be buying safer product and driving the farmers to uh, use safe water and, you know, move the produce farther away from the source of contamination. Uh, obviously, heightened surveillance to catch the outbreak quickly the next year at the same time. Uh, versus, you know, once hundreds of people have become ill. Uh, work groups needed. Um, there were a lot of issues brought up and, you know, um, with COVID, a lot of things got unfortunately sidetracked, but uh, policy group to prioritize and push next steps. Appropriations, what funding is needed, what research is needed, what education is needed, root cause analysis, root, uh, Pew Charitable Trust did some excellent work in that area, building upon that. Salmonella performance standards. Um, what's the acceptable level of salmonella in, in poultry uh, coming out of a processing plant? 
uh, using CDC centers of excellence, uh, getting them to do some research. The CDC said that uh, by by law they can't fund that, but um, you know you've got uh, resources there that could be doing some of that research if we can find the funding. Obviously, vaccine development and promotion was something else is a priority. Uh, antibiotic resistance um, has come up uh, in dealing with CDC. Uh, and there's a lot of different organisms that are resistant, but here were five priority ones, Salmonella infantis associated with chickens, Salmonella redding associated with raw turkey, uh, Salmonella I4512I minus, which has come up with swine and other livestock. And um, to kind of bring up the point of uh, livestock feed uh, being a potential source, Kansas State actually found, found this organism in a swine feed plant which raises some serious questions about, you know, is that a source, uh, not only in swine, but it's come up in poultry and it's come up in, in other livestock. Uh, multiple drug resistant uh, E. coli 15787 with romaine last year, and salmon on Newport from beef. So those were some priority pathogens to take a look at and to see, well, are these coming up in, in livestock feed? Uh, what's the source of these? Some of these were emerging pathogens, such as salmonella i 4512 i minus. Uh, where are they coming from and uh, what can be done to prevent it from you know, expanding in the human population. Obviously everything got sidetracked with COVID-19 and the original projections were over 100,000 cases. And you know, I looked at the numbers yesterday, um, it was 125,539 deaths and greater than 2.5 million cases just in the US. So obviously that became a priority for, for everybody and, and stopped inspections at the federal and state level and, and a lot, I'm sure, at the local level too. Uh, when that started, one of the first things we did is we did a webinar with Ian Williams from CDC. He was the deputy incident commander for COVID-19. We created uh, COVID-19 resource materials on the AFTO website with updates from CDC and FDA. Uh, we did surveys of the states on, on what was happening on current practices. And then we sent out emails to keep people informed of changes in this area. Um, in this area, uh, my job changed entirely in March, and basically they originally put me uh, with looking at uh, illnesses and deaths in nursing homes, and in the first couple of weeks uh, saw that the not excluding people with the close contacts and people with symptoms wasn't working. And, you know, 75% of our deaths have been in nursing homes, and, you know, ill staff spreading it through uh, all kinds of places. So that was a real issue. And so one of the things I learned, and then after the two weeks, they put me in charge of dealing with outbreaks in all businesses in the state, not just food, but any business. And uh, when I, they first gave me that, there were 822 businesses that had clusters of, of cases uh, in the facilities. And, and the thing that I saw is the mask and the six foot separation are critical but that's really a second line of defense. Uh, most of the outbreaks that I was seeing is that there were sick people in the place working. And you can have pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic people shedding, but the majority of the outbreaks I saw that there were sick people working for days. So the first line of defense that we set up is, all right, get sick people out of the place. If you've got a positive person, they're out. If they've got a close contact, somebody who's been within six feet for 15 minutes, they're out of the facility. Uh, we found that in, um, in some food plants, a couple of food plants and in other places, especially in the minority community, you had people who worked very closely together, people who traveled to work together and people who lived together. You often had four or five people in the same household working in the same facility. And if you didn't exclude those family members, you know, those uh, people they lived with, and you didn't exclude the people they traveled to work with, a high percentage of those became ill. Uh, in one food plant, we quarantined 110 um, in one day. Uh, 40 of those people became ill within 10 days. And if we hadn't done it, there were over 700 people in that plant and it would have gone through the whole place very quickly. So, so the people they travel together and the people they live with, uh, you really need to get them out or it blows up on you. Um, we also put in place screening so that anybody coming into the building, um, not only employees, vendors, contractors, customers, uh, they were tested, uh, they were evaluated for all symptoms. And one of the things that we found uh, that led to a number of outbreaks and what crossed the line is we found in some facilities, supervisors were pushing workers to work when they're sick. Uh, come to work or you're fired. Obviously, that's a major problem. And uh, I had a call with a, a vice president in California on, on that happening. And obviously, we straightened out the local facility. But th that's 
obviously can't happen. You had people who maybe the supervisor wasn't pushing them, but they were worried about being fired. So they came to work, uh, uh, they came to work anyway. You also had people being asked only the top three symptoms at first. Do you have a fever? Do you have coughing? Uh, coughing? Do you have difficulty breathing? They said no. And then we found that people were working with a runny nose and a sore throat and they were positive. So it was asking all the symptoms. And we immediately developed posters in English and in Spanish to post at the door to say, hey, do you have any of these symptoms? And if so, you don't come in the place. Uh, you also had people who just needed the money. And if they didn't get, uh, they weren't eligible for unemployment or they weren't eligible for sick time, maybe they were undocumented, did not report the symptoms and work anyway. So those are some lessons learned. Uh, the other thing that we did is we found reporting through testing is way too slow. So I had our GIS staff develop a survey form and we had um, businesses reporting daily uh, through this survey form, the number of positive cases and who they were, um, their people reporting to work with symptoms and quarantine individuals. And we were able to develop close contacts and get them out of the place. We did emails to the food industry and to thousands of uh, businesses through the Manufacturing Association as to prevention. Uh, we also had teleconferences on prevention and to answer questions. Uh, and uh, some people had misconceptions that you could shorten quarantine by being tested, and that's not the case. We also closed hookah and other bars. And we found the highest attack rates in nursing homes, uh, food processing, cleaning crews, and temp agencies. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'd like to give a lot of credit to Steve on is uh, from March 16th to June 19th, we had AFTO professional development webinars, 86 webinars, three weeks uh, uh, full-time training, 12,589 participants. I mean, that's great. 6,627 unique participants and 15,000 views online. And uh, the distribution of people who, who watch these things with 38% Uh, to reduce foodborne illnesses, long-term disabilities, and we'll be turning over the presidency to Mark here, but you know, mandate sick time for employees, or they can make up the time. Mandate manages certification. Change the priority from the number of inspections or inspection frequency to eliminating serious hazards to health. We've got 100,000 cows with leafy greens right next to, uh, that were right next to the irrigation water. That's not rocket science. I mean, you can't have cows, uh, which are the major source of E. coli 157H7, contaminating the water and then spraying that onto ready to eat foods. And you had clouds of dust uh, blowing 100 feet into the air and onto lettuce fields. I mean, you know, powdered manure, uh, that can't happen. And the irrigation water there was positive. Uh, obviously, mandating improved traceability releasing names of farms and facilities involved in outbreaks. Tell the buyers, industry and consumers, where it's safe to buy and where it's not to. Conducting environmental assessments and testing next year at the same time to make sure it's safe. If you can't stop the source of contamination where outbreaks occurred and ready foods will continue to be grown, then the water's gonna be treated. If clouds and manure are blowing onto ready foods, then ready foods should not be grown in that area. And this isn't rocket science, but there are things that keep happening and they keep causing illness. Uh, vaccines are talked about, performing ready, uh, whole genome sequencing on Campylobacter to find and eliminate the source, and evaluating livestock feed to see if that's a source of antibiotic resistance. And the big thing is acting now. Basically, uh, while research needs to be done, uh, we don't want to delay things uh, that could prevent illness because of uh, research. Awards. Um, we've got great AFTO staff, committee chairs, and representatives. It's been a pleasure working with all of them this year. Many provided great service, but there are a few people that really stood out. And, and Steve, uh, our executive director, is, uh, you know, showed outstanding leadership and initiative during this pandemic, and I really like to recognize him. Crystal Reed, our association manager, juggling multiple grants and staff, and you know, providing great service in this time. Uh, other awards: We've got John Wheeler from South Carolina Department of Health and Environment for photography at the 2019 conference. We've got Laurel Aragona with Sudical Labs for a body art committee. I mean, she was running meetings weekly. Uh, I was amazed at the amount of work she did. Sandra Craig, South Carolina Department of Health and Environment for leadership in virtual inspections and providing information to all interested states. Uh, Beth Wittry from CDC and Dr. Art Liang for providing great assistance with the Healthy People 2030 event in January of 2020. 
So those are the major awards. And I'd like to thank you and, and all of the uh, AFTEL membership for, for your assistance. So with that, um, I think we can uh, turn it over to our panel and uh, some introductions here. So our first speaker is uh, Judy McMeekin, and uh, she's Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs, the ACRA. And when I first started with, F, uh, with uh, the state, I never knew what the ACRA was. <laughs> now I do. <laughs> it took a while. The ACRA? What's an ACRA? <laughs> so the ACRA is the Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs within the Office of Regulatory Affairs at the Food and Drug Administration. She has responsibility for over 5,000 staff and operations in ORA, including inspections, investigations, including criminal investigations, uh, compliance and enforcement, import operations, regulatory science, and field laboratory operations. O ORA also works closely with global, federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial partners, and administers contracts, grants, and cooperative agreements to advance an integrated system and ensure an effective public health safety net. Prior to becoming ACRA, Dr. McMeekin served as the Deputy Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs, Acting Director of ORA's Office of Strategic Planning and Operational Policy, and as the Director of the Division of Operational Policy. Dr. McMeekin began her FDA career in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research in the Office of Compliance, eventually serving as a Director, Division of Prescription Drugs. Before joining FDA, she worked in the United States pharmacopoeia, and several health systems as a clinical pharmacist. Dr. McMeekin received her Bachelor of Science degree in pharmacy and her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from Northeastern University in Boston, Mass. So, uh, uh, Judy, uh, if you'd like to start off, uh, we'll turn it over to you, and then we'll introduce the other panelists as they come up. Great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me to be with you today. It certainly is my honor to be here as FDA's Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs, or the ACRA, uh, a position that I assumed earlier this year in mid-April. So today I, along with other several of our operational leads, will provide you with an update on ORA. This will include our priorities, what we have accomplished this year, and also our plans for the future. Before I share my thoughts, it is important to note that COVID-19 has undoubtedly required us to shift our focus and our, our focus and to reprioritize our work so that we can be most helpful to response efforts. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a learning experience for us all. It has changed the way consumers behave and has changed the way that industry operates too. And we must adapt to this new environment. A prime example can be seen in the retail space where consumers have shifted to online purchases for food. Though we knew this was happening and we were planning for it, the pandemic pushed the predicted trend uh, of an increase in online consumption forward. FDA will work with our regulatory and industry stakeholders to determine the best ways to educate distributors, manufacturers, and retailers on the importance of temperature control, cross-contamination, and other safety measures. We will also explore how to adapt uh, our oversight to help ensure the safety of new ingredients, foods, and production methods. Even with our shift of focus due to the pandemic, we have made considerable progress towards our ongoing priorities. Hiring remains a priority for everyone on this call, and it is continuing during this time of increased telework and social distancing. I would like to share some of our recent successes, but I would also like to set the stage for future discussions around how we can hire and train staff together, as I see all of us as one public health workforce. We've demonstrated resiliency by adapting to a virtual uh, hiring process that includes video interviewing, online onboarding, and even virtual oaths of office to maximize speed and effectiveness. ORA has hired 158 candidates since we first posted our direct hire authority announcement for consumer safety officer positions last December. We've also interviewed more than 500 applicants so far. Among our new hires are members of our executive leadership team. 
I'm glad to have Elizabeth Miller on board as our new Assistant Commissioner for Medical Products and Tobacco Operations. In this role, Elizabeth oversees the Office of Bioresearch Monitoring Operations, the Office of Biologic Products Operations, the Office of Medical Device and Rad Radiologic Health Operations, the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Operations, and the Office of Tobacco Operations. Before joining ORA, Dr. Miller previously worked for the United States Pharmacopeia as Vice President for the U.S. Public Policy and Regulatory Affairs, Global um, External Affairs. And it is also my pleasure to introduce Carol Pave as our Acting Deputy Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs. Carol supports me with operational activities, including enforcement, collaborations, laboratory work, and strategic planning. Among other positions, Carol previously served as the Assistant Commissioner of ORA's Office of, Import in, uh, at Office of Enforcement in Import Operations and had responsibility for providing direction and oversight of FDA's field import operations. I'm delighted to have her on board in this new capacity. And now a little bit more about ORA's recent activities. One of the activities that we've initiated during this pandemic is an enhanced official establishment inventory improvement activity that not only validates our human and animal food inventories, but it also allows us to share the important COVID-19 related resources with these firms. We know that many states assist in these efforts and we will add this element to state contracts as they are renewed. Validated inventory will make all of our inspections more efficient. ORA has also worked with FDA's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition and the Office of Food and Veterinary Medicine to initiate a seafood pilot later this year. The pilot will focus on shipments of shrimp and safety concerns related to foreign processed shrimp products, which addresses both congressional and industry concerns. Elements in the proposed pilot include advanced targeting, newer IT technology, and pre-arrival information working with U.S. Customs and Border Protection. We look forward to launching this pilot to improve our processes. While we continue to perform mission critical inspections, we've also exhibited agility in identifying and implementing new approaches to achieve our mission and ensure employees' safety. For instance, we are evaluating firm records in lieu of or in advance of conducting certain on-site inspections on an interim basis when travel is not permitted. Our Assistant Commissioner for Human and Animal Foods, Michael Rogers, will speak on this in greater detail in a few minutes. We are also leveraging inspection reports completed through the European Union Mutual Recognition Agreement by capable authorities of inspections conducted outside of the European Union. Our partnership with the EU member states is providing to be of tremendous value as we na navigate the current regulatory environment. Our Foreign Supplier Verification Program, or FSVP, remains a high priority for our imports program. In March of this year, we started using remote FSVP assessment protocols to conduct inspections. We've noted that remote FSVP assessments have been effective at generating several warning letters, even during the COVID-19 pandemic. We continue to prioritize high-risk, food examination and sampling at the ports of entry. This has included findings of microbiological pathogens of salmonella and albano in several imported foods. We also created or adjusted import alerts and flags for PREDICT, which is our risk-based import screening tool, so that foreign manufactured products could be sampled at the ports of entry. Import staff at the international mail facilities continue to focus on entries containing spike dietary supplements, opioid products, unapproved drugs, and fraudulent medical products. We are closely monitoring the global situation so that as the pandemic conditions improve, we will be prepared to resume routine on-site surveillance inspections with the appropriate personal protective measures in place. 
The FDA is following the White House guidelines for opening up America again, a roadmap for optimizing operations and new work arrangements. FDA is utilizing these guidelines for resuming domestic routine surveillance inspections. We're in the process of developing a tool to qualitatively indicate the status of COVID-19 outbreaks in a local area based on state and national criteria. This tool will help FDA make informed risk-based decisions on when and where to resume domestic surveillance inspections using the best available data. We will share details of this tool soon with our stakeholders and our state partners. You'll hear more on this today from Michael Rogers and our Assistant Commissioner for Partnerships and Policy, Eric Mettler. We are also continue to improve our core operations. The FDA is committed to reducing foodborne illness from retail and food service establishments, which unfortunately continues to be a substantial public health burden. We cannot achieve our strategic goal of reducing the occurrence of foodborne illness risk factors without our state, local, tribal, and territorial regulatory partners, as well as our association and industry partners. Working together, we are confident we can bend the foodborne illness curve, but we must be innovative and employ different strategies than we have had in the past. Of note, we are implementing the blueprint for the new era of smarter food safety, an initiative de uh, developed and shaped by valuable input from you and from our other stakeholder partners. New era is charting the course to enable us to keep pace with the many anticipated changes in the food system over the next 10 years. The four core elements of new era are tech enabled traceability, smarter tools and approaches for prevention and outbreak response, new business models and retail modernization, and a food safety culture. You will hear more about these exciting initiatives from our other speakers, and we'll share more detail in the coming weeks to months. As a strong integrated food safety system is essential to a safe food supply, Domestic mutual reliance is a key component of the new era of Smarter Food Safety Initiative. The essence of domestic mutual reliance is partnerships, which are perhaps never more necessary than during challenging times. To truly achieve domestic mutual reliance, our level of engagement must increase. The information flow and trust must be unencumbered and in real time. Our interactions with the implementation of FISMA was just the start. We are always looking for new and innovative ways to engage. and would love to hear what you might think would be opportunities for this um, in the future. Eric Mettler will join Michael Rogers to discuss domestic mutual reliance, a major priority for us, especially as we resume our domestic on-site surveillance inspections in greater depth. In support of expanding our public health partnerships, we are working to expand collaborations with the state, local, and foreign regulatory partners. We are enhancing the integrated food safety system and working towards using FISMA state inspection data. Additionally, our retail food program standards enable us to build infrastructure and capacity in state and local agencies. We plan to expand these arrangements with other states going forward, which will enhance our regulatory efficiencies and reduce the burden on industry. The pandemic has not deferred us from investing in our infrastructure. For example, last year we kicked off a multi-year effort to upgrade our labs. When we opened a new facility in Alameda, California for our district and laboratory workforce. Construction of the new Kansas City Laboratory will be done in September 2020. The new Winchester Engineering and Analytical Center is currently under construction, and that is scheduled to be completed in 2021. We are also relocating the Atlanta Laboratory and District Office 
as well as expanding the Forensic Chemistry Center in Cincinnati, both which will be completed in 2022. We continue to leverage our technological advances by exploring new platforms to do our work more efficiently. We are looking um, at how to integrate machine learning capabilities into our processes to identify and implement solutions that make our current processes more efficient. There is too much in the works to itemize here, but please know these advancements support all of our operational components and programs. The current pandemic has presented many challenges to our work. However, it is also presenting opportunities for us to innovate and reassess how we carry out our work. Going forward, among many other changes, I would like to see greater flexibility in the contract process, expansion of the non-contract inspection program to other states, and hopefully one day soon, in-person meetings again. But we can't do it alone. As we look to our future, ORA will continue to rely on collaborations with trusted partners like AFDO. We are truly in uncharted territory. As you know, we face challenging weeks and months ahead. There hasn't been a pandemic of this scale before in most of our lifetimes, but we've already seen a heroic response from the public health community. I believe our efforts illustrate a positive and significant impact on the public health that could not happen without all of you. Thank you again for your partnership and shared commitment to public health. Now I would like to turn it over to Michael Rogers, who will discuss the human and animal food operations. Thank you very much. Michael? All right, Michael, would you, uh, you're on mute, so maybe I'll introduce you before uh, you start off. So Michael Rogers is the Assistant Commissioner for Human and Animal Health, called HAF, Operations in the Office of Regulatory Affairs, ORA, focusing on inspection and compliance related issues in the human and animal health food programs. Overseeing the program directors for East and West HAF operations, as well as state cooperative programs. Mr. Rogers joined the FDA in 1991 as a field investigator in the Baltimore District. He then became a supervisory investigator at the Northern Virginia Resident Post, a branch director at FDA headquarters, director of the Division of Field Op Investigations, and was later selected as the director of FDA Latin American Office. Mr. Rogers has a Bachelor's of Science degree in Chemistry and Zoology from North Carolina State University, and a Master's degree in Management from the University of Maryland University. Uh, Michael? Tony, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, perfect. So good afternoon and good morning to some. Um, it's a pleasure to be, to be with you today, and, and I hope you and your families are well. Um, in, in years past, I've provided an update on some key initiatives within the Office of Human and Animal Foods and ORA, and I'll do that this year. Um, as, as part of providing an update on staffing and some ongoing programs that we have in ongoing on in collaboration with our state. But you'll see as part of my updates and the questions that we received in advance of this conference um, and the method in which we're having it, um, a major theme of what I'll share with you this year relates to the impact of COVID on our ability to carry out our mission. And first, let me emphasize how important these meetings are in that they serve as an opportunity to engage with AFTO and our state partners. Um, they allow us to recalibrate our, our regulatory compasses each year to a degree, and they're critical because it's an opportunity to align our efforts with our state partners who are our co-regulators with the FDA for our shared inventories. But as I mentioned, you know, th this year is different. Uh, we're presently dealing with the largest public health crisis of our lifetime. Uh, we're all here virtually today after essentially 13 weeks of shelter in place. We've seen disruptions to our personal lives and we've missed graduations and weddings and our kids are at home and certainly have a better appreciation for their teachers. Um, we may have also lost someone or know someone who has lost someone due to COVID. And so while we're all managing our unique personal challenges, 
professionally, we've all been anxious about our inability to carry out our mission in our traditional way. Beyond the, the mission critical inspections that we've been conducting during this time, I can tell you that has been a challenge for all of us. I can say though that the process that um, we've identified presently that represents our new routine work um, as a result of COVID um, will be work activities that we will continue to expand on in the future. But we are in different times. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about people on the front lines and, and certainly our healthcare workers and our first responders are, are gonna be certainly the, the true heroes of this pandemic. But I'll offer that we regulators also have a frontline role as it relates to the regulatory oversight that we provide over the firms that are part of a critical infrastructure. You know, there was no, no script for this, um, but reflecting on what we've done and, and what we continue to do, I know that, that we regulators, FDA and our states, um, we, we've made a difference. And so I just want to say thank you to our state partners and AFTO for all that you do um, with us as co-regulators with, with the FDA. So today I'd like to provide an update on our hiring within OHAFO. I'll address what we've been doing with our workforce during COVID-19. I'll give you a sense of some lessons learned or things we should consider as we approach this new norm under COVID. And I'll talk about our current thinking related to the resumption of routine oh. domestic inspections and perhaps set the stage to, to elaborate on these issues during our panel discussion. So the first topic I'll cover is hiring and, and staffing. Um, OHAFO has a staff of about 1,150 FTE um, in our half east and half west programs, our audits group, as well as the state cooperative programs. We have about 991 bodies on board and we're in the process of hiring to fill that gap. Um, and we have made a lot of progress during the past six months to get closer to that ceiling. Um, if you think about a number of our vacancies relate to those operational activities, inspections, investigations, sample collections, audits, um, and the work that the state cooperative programs do um, overseeing the states and the areas of retail milk and shellfish, um, I can tell you that one of the major challenges that we have has been the onboarding process under COVID. You know, typically our staff are subject to an intense new hire training program during that first year. They receive formal and, and on-the-job training. I think, I think when I first joined, I, I had my first road trip um, the first three weeks of joining FDA and taking that very important oath. Um, the first six months for a new hire are critical. Um, and they really allow managers and senior investigators to educate those new hires. To, to take them under their wing, to, to share with them um, the procedures and, and, and about the IOM and the, the how, but as well as the why we do what we do. Um, there's also a, a process to share that culture. Um, FDA, ORA is an organization with over 100 years of history and culture. And those stories and culture are shared as part of that onboarding process within that first six months to a year. Um, I imagine the states are also dealing and, and having this, this challenge, um, but it has been difficult. Um, and so um, to, to supplement that effort, um, in addition to our online training, for this particular new hire cohort from January to present, um, we had our first virtual welcome by the OHAFO immediate office. Um, we had presentations from me and our program managers from East and West, um, as well as audits and state cooperative programs. Um, it was an opportunity to help bridge the gap that these new hires aren't getting, as well as um, have that cultural download. We also shared with this group um, some things that we wish we would have been told when we first joined the organization. Um, we had, I think within that group, us five, over 130 years of FDA experience between the five managers that presented during this virtual OHAFO welcome to the organization. Um, 
And so that, that was uh, something that we did um, to, to bridge the gap. Related to staffing, um, starting on Wednesday, we'll have a key vacancy in OHAFO, which will be the first day of Joanne Gibbons' retirement. Many of you know Joanne and have worked with her in various capacities over the years. Um, I note that many of you were able to participate in her virtual retirement surprise ceremony last Thursday. Um, so thank you for that. For, and, and so for that position, we plan to run a series of 60-day details for the Half West Program Director. Um, and so your contacts will be Glenn Bass, initially Scott McIntyre, who is, well, Glenn Bass is the Deputy Director of Half West. Um, Scott McIntyre, who is the Director of the Enforcement Division. Latanya Mitchell will be next, who is the Division Director of Half West 4. And then Mick Ducher is the Division Director of Half West 1. As part of our hiring efforts, we also increased the ORA PSN from 14 to 24 investigators with two supervisory investigators. Um, many of you know that in March of 2019, we began conducting routine surveillance inspections of farms covered under the produce safety rule. Um, as you know, we have 44 states who are participating in a cooperative agreement, and those 44 states are doing independent inspections in those states. Um, and then FDA is doing independent inspections in six states and all foreign. But last year, we noticed that there were a number of outbreaks that we had to manage. And a number of those outbreaks was an unprecedented number, but a lot of them involved produce. And for us, our produce safety network is a dedicated staff that conduct produce inspections, but they're also the same staff that we use to conduct root cause investigations and follow up to these outbreaks. And so it was critical that we increase the size of our produce safety network. We just brought those individuals on board and they're in the process of, of being trained and shadowing our senior um, investigators. One key initiative um, that we have uh, ongoing presently, um, and it, it relates to our efforts, and Ernie, you mentioned this, um, uh, the, the driving force for a lot of the planned work is trying to achieve the inspection frequency mandates, and both FDA and the states um, have those inspection frequency mandates. If you recall, last year we announced the development of a program that allowed FDA and the states to use each other's inspections outside of the contract process to count towards our inspection frequency mandates. And as you're aware and most know, under the Food Safety Modernization Act, FDA is required to inspect high-risk firms every three years and non-high-risk firms every five years. And then when you look at the inventory of 80,000 or so domestic um, human food manufacturers, um, we thought about developing and have developed and socialized an annualized work plan approach. Um, and we calculated that as regulators, um, FDA in the states would need to conduct about 18,500 inspections each year to achieve that inspection frequency mandate. But if you forecasted forward and only use the covered by date to drive what you inspect, we know that in FY22, we would be inspecting more non-high-risk firms than we've ever had in the history of the program. And total between high risk and non high risk, it would be a number that was not achievable. And thinking about that, one of the ways we addressed it was to develop a program for those states that are in full conformance with the manufactured food regulatory program standards, meeting 10 out of 10, and there are 43 states participating, and presently 31 are in full conformance. We found a way to count towards our inspection frequency mandate those inspections that were non contract non-violative, non-high risk, um, and we, were allowed, we allowed those to count towards our inspection frequency mandate. Um, that program, and we announced this last year, um, since then we um, have a, a really robust relationship with Florida. Um, Florida was our initial state. We achieved a proof of process with Florida. Um, they have entered as many as 210 firms into FDA's
obtaining additional data from Wisconsin, and we have other states based on their inventories we're reaching out to. But I can tell you that, and I know Eric Mettler is going to talk a little bit about this, we did recognize that there's a significant learning curve associated with the data systems that the states are using to get data, non-contract data into our system. So the National Food Safety Data Exchange and the ORA Partners Portal are those two options. Um, and it does take a lot of time um, and, and, and sweat equity w within the state to, to um, navigate through the criteria and get that data in the system. So I can tell you that one of the things we're thinking about is um, utilizing existing or creating a funding stream that would create a two-way flow of data, inspection data, between FDA and the state. It's something we're talking about for FY21 that would um, compensate the states, perhaps from an administrative standpoint, and facilitate getting that data into our system and having an exchange of our data into the state system. So stay tuned on that, and, and perhaps Eric is going to elaborate on that. Um, but we're, we're looking at um, trying to develop something um, for FY21. I, I do want to pivot to um, our activities under COVID and some lessons learned as a result of COVID. Um, I do think the expansion of the non-contract inspection program helps both FDA and the states um, meet our, our regulatory oversight mandates. Um, and so that's uh, a, something we had in motion, but I see more um, a use for that more so un under COVID as this continues. But during the pandemic, um, after we suspended routine domestic inspections on March 18th, we continue to focus on mission critical work. At that time, we had 31 inspections that were ongoing um, on, on March 18th, and we considered those as mission critical at that time because we needed to close them out. Um, we also, since March 18th, initiated about 25 or so inspections or investigations um, after March 18th that fell into the areas of compliance follow-up, um, interstate travel program to, to issue the sanitation certificates, um, foodborne outbreak investigations, and recall follow-up inspections and investigations. We also, though, identified work activities that had become our new temporary norm under COVID that, that allow us to, to leverage our workforce that is not conducting mission-critical work. Um, Dr. McMeekin mentioned um, some of those activities. One relates to closing out all of our open inspections. We, there were uh, 800, almost 900 um, domestic and foreign inspections that were going through what we call the life cycle of an inspection. And admittedly, some of them were old. Um, we closed all of those out um, uh, as one of those um, work activities that, that we engaged in during COVID. But we also began an enhanced remote official establishment improvement activity that focused on using our workforce to validate by phone the inventory for human and animal food manufacturers. Um, and as part of that process, we were able, engaging with firms, to share the most recent information with them on the, the CDC and FDA web pages. Um, but we were also able to identify firms that had um, reduced operations or that had closed um, as part of that outreach. You know, one of the, the lessons learned um, as part of COVID is that although some of the states had OEI improvement in their contracts, some didn't, and the ones that did, some had a limit to the number of OEI improvement activities that they could do. So that's something that we're looking to change as part of the contract renewal process. Um, but in total, the, the, this inventory validation effort um, resulted in validating 29,878 firms in the human food inventory and about 3,000 firms in, in CDM's inventory. And, and as part of the, the prep for one of the hearings, we, we did explain to people the value of identifying a washout. Um, as you know, in the domestic arena, most of our inspections are unannounced. Sending an investigator to conducting an inspection of a firm where we don't have a clear understanding of what they do, or even worse, if they're out of business, um, is, is, is a waste of resources. And so this validation effort um, is information that can be used by both FDA and the states. 
um, as a way to, to streamline and make our inspections more efficient when we resume normal operation. Another lesson learned, um, really an opportunity, relates to the use of and, and future use of a new tool that I think will be with us as regulators. And we're calling it remote regulatory assessments and program evaluations. For, for background, um, some programs on the medical product side of the house have the regulatory authority to request records in advance of or in lieu of an inspection. Um, in the foods program, we don't have that. There is a process called A19 where the agency can um, make requests for additional authorities um, and, and we'll see what happens. But I do see this as a tool that we'll be using more of in the future, whether or not it's grounded under our regulatory authority or if it's voluntary. I do think that um, the state contracts, when they are updated, needs to include this remote um, regulatory assessments and program evaluations as part of the language within the contracts. But essentially, um, it allows us to request records in advance of or in lieu of an inspection, but it also allows us to streamline um, that inspection, and in some cases, even obviate the need to do the inspection. Um, we, we added program evaluations because we envision that um, the oversight of the Manufactured Food Regulatory Program Standards, or AFRIPS, or the oversight that state cooperative program provides for the states and retail milk and shellfish, that there will be records that we can request in advance of our need to actually physically go there. Um, to, to capture this new tool and the use of it, we're creating um, two new operations codes that will be available to the states. One will be for domestic and one will be foreign. And together with inspections, we envision using this tool to help better tell our story of our regulatory oversight of our shared inventories. You know, because of COVID, I think, um, as Dr. McMeekin mentioned, the, the retail landscape will forever be changed. Many of you know that the new era of smarter food safety referenced um, the need to look at and revitalize retail. Um, and I do recall comments from AFCO and the Food Marketing Institute um, that gave us some really good suggestions to consider um, as it relates to how we modernize our oversight of retail. And, you know, as you know, this is done by the states or 2,100 or so jurisdictions, but FDA provides that cooperative program related oversight between ORA as, as well as CISFAM. But the states have that inspection and regulatory um, oversight and authority. Um, but all of those comments and all of that activity was pre-COVID. I think COVID has exacerbated the need to look at and revitalize retail, especially when you think of the amount of people who are purchasing products online. It raises questions about how were those products packed or held or where did they come from um, and, and, and what type of regulatory oversight should we provide in that, um, in that chain of, of, of events that happen from manufacturer to, to, to our table. Um, and so stay tuned on that, but we're, we're certainly looking at, at retail. As it relates to the resumption of routine domestic inspections, as Dr. McMeekin mentioned, we are in the process of developing a tool that utilizes various federal and state data sets that will inform where we are able to initiate routine inspections in all program areas, um, ideally down to the county level. Um, as, as part of the, the, the process, um, we're looking at those surveillance inspections that were postponed. Um, we're trying to prioritize those that were targeted for um, this, this um, fiscal year. Um, we're looking at them um, using a certain number of, of criteria based on um, OAI follow-up, um, whether or not for us the firm is in a high-risk or non-high-risk category, um, uh, follow-up to, to um, uh, firms that have promised corrective actions, uh, other criteria related to whether or not a firm has never been inspected, as well as the type of product and where that firm is located. Um, and I know this will be a subject of, of our panel discussion, um, and we can elaborate on that. I can tell you that um, one of the decisions that we made early on was that when we resume routine domestic inspections and for the mission critical inspections that we're presently conducting, we will continue to pre-announce all inspections in the domestic arena. We have developed a script, we've shared that with our states, 
um, that guides that discussion. Um, it's also designed to tease out, if you will, whether or not a firm has reduced um, their manufacturing operations, um, what type of um, provisions they have with respect to safety, um, as well as um, whether or not they're managing an ongoing outbreak within that facility. And so um, we, we, we expect to use this script to pre-announce our inspections. We will demonstrate extreme flexibility in working with industry on the timing of those inspections, especially if there are certain circumstances that warrant us to, to demonstrate that flexibility. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm close to or maybe over my, my 10 minutes, and, and I suspect um, I'll have a chance to, to elaborate on many of these topics during the panel discussion. So I, I look forward to, to sharing some additional information with you, but thank you for the opportunity to present again this year at, at AFCO's virtual conference. Ernie, back to you. Thank you, Michael. All right, so I think we've got, um, let's see, Eric up next. Uh, Eric is Assistant Commissioner for Partnerships and Policy within the Office of Regulatory Affairs, ORA, and the Food and Drug Administration. In this role, he serves as advisor to the Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs on the full range of ORA's activities, including partnerships, implementation of new laws and regulations, and overall strategic planning and prioritization. He's responsible for providing long-range strategic direction for ORA policies and programs, including the implementation of the Food Safety Modernization Act. Mr. Mettler previously served as the Associate Commissioner for Foods and Veterinary Medicine in the Office of Foods and Veterinary Medicine. His years of experience at the FDA gave him a broad perspective on public health, policy, and administrative management, along with an awareness of critical issues at all levels of the agency. Mr. Mettler holds a Master of Public Health from the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University and a Master of Public Administration from the University of New Mexico. Eric? Thank you, Ernie. And let me just start off by um, one Ernie saying thank you for everything being a president. It's been fantastic to actually have you as AFTA's president. Um, I sort of harken back to uh, the meeting that we had on 2030. Um, and that's, for whatever reason, it seems like a decade ago now. That was just back in January. Yeah. That is the right direction. That's sort of where I really try to look and look out into the future about where we're going and what we're doing. So that meeting itself was just absolutely pinnacle and pivotal to our futures and where we're going. Now, that being said, you know, that was pre-COVID, but the way we did it and the way we're looking out that far, even if a COVID happens in there, we still have that long-term plan to address those out here goals and those measures. So that is just absolutely key. And thank you. And I hope that continues over the course of the coming years to really sort of look at those long-term goals and build it out. Um, I also wanted to thank everyone else on the phone. Uh, this has been trying times as both uh, Dr. McMeekin and Michael said, um, and I think everyone else, um, but you all are really keeping us safe. You're keeping the food supply safe. You're keeping my family safe, my extended family safe. So just overarching, thank you. Um, I can't say that enough. Um, I just really want to spend my time really on three points. Um, I love this panel discussion, so I sort of want to get to that, uh, but I'll just really sort of focus on three main points at the beginning. Um, and they really are on domestic mutual reliance, uh, retail, and then the overall food safety metrics as we move forward. Uh, first is uh, domestic mutual reliance. Uh, we've been talking about this a lot in the context of mutual reliance, and what we are doing at FDA is really sort of taking a look internally to where we are and where we're going with that. Um, and I think, you know, you'll notice some changes uh, with uh, some of the terminology we're using. For example, the term domestic mutual reliance. We're really sort of putting that out front now as one of the main pieces of this. And this really uh, is due to a major piece that we found uh, happening within FDA. Um, that within the food side of the house, we're using the term mutual reliance, and then and it meant sort of on a domestic capacity working with the states. But from a medical product side, they were actually using the term mutual reliance or internationally mutual reliance of how they worked with um, international partners, specifically the EU. And so what we're really trying to do is we know that terminology matters, and so we're trying to make that the best case scenario and really try to get these terminologies nailed down as we start applying uh, mutual reliance, the terminology broad um, across the board and really start accepting um, and moving forward into these areas. Also, what we've really discovered recently, and Michael touched on this, is sort of the information sharing. As we go down the path of domestic mutual reliance, we are going to be sharing more and more information with each other. And the thing that we've uh, sort of stumbled across, and I'm sure this is uh, no surprise to any of you, is really sort of the disclosure laws that are, uh, that are with the federal government and how much information, when we can share it, and how we share it with the states. This is going to be a pinnacle um, part of mutual reliance, and it's going to be a major focus of the agency over the coming uh, months, years, 
to really sort of get that down. Again, at the end of the day, if we are going to be mutual aligned, if we're going to rely and trust on each other, we really need to share this information freely backwards and forwards. Um, so we will be uh, talking more about that in the future and just sort of really want to give it as a teaser out there that we understand that there's a variety of issues here and we're going to do everything we can to really address that. Next piece of that is really to make sure that um, we are touching base with the states. Mutual reliance, domestic mutual reliance is not something that we can do uh, within FDA alone. We are going to start building um, and learning uh, from the states of what you guys do and how you see it working at the end of the day. We have done a lot of pro, uh, um, proof of processes recently. Michael touched on some of them with Florida, with California, with Wisconsin, um, with New York. How can we take these best practices that we're showing um, with these proof of processes, sharing information, sharing decisions that the states are making, and then apply it across the nation? And we're going to try to do that systematically over the course of the coming years as well. A big part of this, though, is really sort of relying on funding. Um, so I do want to sort of you know note that the FDA does understand that this is a big part of anything that we do across the board, both at the federal level and the domestic level. Funding is absolutely key. So we need to find new funding systems or funding opportunities for data systems to help enhance that. Michael mentioned that a little bit before. So as we come forward with new cooperative agreements and contracts, we're going to be looking ways to, at ways to be flexible um, in these contracts and, and um, grants. And I must say, during the COVID-19 experience, this is one of the times where I think we were trying to, and we are going to try to have as much flexibility in those programs as we possibly can. With the country opening up and shutting down back and forth, what we want to make sure is that you guys have a stable stream of funding to make sure that people are trained, people still are employed and are able to do their jobs at the end of the day with it opening and closing. So just uh, one, funding will be there. We have no plans of cutting it back for anyone. We know there's a lot of um, discussion around resources within the states um, due to the COVID response, but this will be a steady funding stream um, that we are going to try to save as much as we possibly can and really sort of move it forward. Um, so as building that out, really what we want to do is maintain everything that we're doing and then really start uh, socializing it more and talking about it more. And I believe we spoke about this to some extent at uh, the last uh, meeting on 2030 is how do we actually share the experiences that we were doing around mutual alliance, promote it up and get everyone to understand and that's not only just sort of in this environment where everyone on the phone here understands what it is, but how do we promote it outside so the legislators and other folks can understand and truly sort of understand how we are sharing information, how we are working as one workforce, if you will. And that goes also to hiring, which we are going to try to help um, everyone look at hiring in a new way and really focus to make sure that we have a good pool of candidates in the future. Uh, jumping to retail, uh, I believe Judy and uh, Michael both mentioned um, that the new era of Smart Food Safety is going to be released, uh, hopefully in the coming weeks to months. Um, hopefully on the earlier side than that. Uh, one of the key parts on there, and I believe you've heard this over and over again, is retail. And retail is just absolutely key to the vast majority of what we're doing. You guys live it and breathe it. We really sort of understand that, really sort of want to make it forward. As part of that, uh, as you most know, uh, we've been working on a five-year strategic plan, and we hope to roll that out over the coming um, months as well. And that really is sort of working with the collaborative uh, for retail. And this is going you know, to be really no surprise, I think, for any of you on there, but really some of the key components are focusing on uniformity, consistency, and capacity of the retail food programs across the board, uh, promote industries, uh, active managerial control, and um, the illness risk factors, and, and really building up that culture of food safety. Now, the culture of food safety is something I'm not going to touch on here, but you will see a significant portion of that in the era of smarter food safety when it does roll out. Now, jumping back to uh, retail specifically, um, there is a whole piece in the new era that is sectioned out for um, retail. And it's really around the new business models and modernizations um, that has come out. As uh, Dr. McMeekin mentioned in the beginning, COVID really has accelerated that. You know, back, I believe, in January, we kept using the terminology over the course of the next five years, 10 years, we really see e commerce, um, and that's the way most people will be receiving their. Uh, groceries and doing most of their shopping, it'd be delivered to their home, these type of things. COVID really pushed that up. It really changed the dynamic of how people are shopping and what they are willing to do. So we are now seeing, you know, almost the 50% increase, if not more, in that space where they are ordering online, where they are receiving it. And that has changed distribution models. It has changed sort of the entire landscape of retail. 
And so one of the major pieces in the new era is to looking at those new business models, what roles we all should be playing, how we're actually classifying facilities, um, warehouses and things like that in this new dynamic. The other part really is, you know, as I mentioned before, is working with um, the Retail Food Safety Regulatory Association Collaborative. Um, and really what we've done is we're taking everything that we've done to date with that collaborative and leveraging it and putting it into the area of smarter food safety. And again, this is really sort of all those key pieces of pushing forward active managerial control, assessing and identifying, promoting intervention strategies to really sort of reduce that foodborne illness. Make sure that there's risk-based inspection methods um, that everyone can be used and programs to help support that at the end of the day. Uh, really develop curricula that everyone has access to and toolkits that everyone has ac access to so we can maintain that consistency across the board. Uh, one of the things I also want to sort of just let everyone know is that in addition this uh, coming year, we are going to stand up the Retail Flexible Food Funding Model. You've heard a lot of this over the past years. Um, from the Office of Partnerships, really sort of promoting this as a way to increase um, the uniformity, capacity, and capabilities of the state regulatory agencies and really give us more flexibility of how we um, distribute the money and what you can do with those um, resources once you get it. The last thing, and I think this is sort of one of my most important things and then one of the things that keeps me up at night is metrics. Um, Ernie, I believe you mentioned in the beginning, but this is really sort of the key success of our future of how we do things. One, both you and Michael mentioned, how do we um, get away from uh, these measures in place that are, you know, I like to call them widgets, if you will. Just counting, you know, high risk and, and low risk, or not sorry, no risk, not high risk um, activities, and really going after the amount of inspections that we do versus the quality and are we actually spending our resources in the appropriate area. That is just absolutely key. And I think everyone across the board needs to hear that over and over and over and over again. Um, so the more everyone on the phone can help us with that, the better. The next part really is transparency. We have a lot of data. How are we sharing it? How are we getting it out there? How are we telling you know, that we are having a return on investment on all of our resources that we are collectively using? A lot of you are familiar with um, FDA track and our food safety dashboard. Um, over the coming uh, hopefully year, you're gonna see uh, FDA expanded once again and expanded out to produce and sprout safety. So we're gonna keep doing those, those um, really sort of transparency and type dashboards. Love to have a discussion with everyone at some point is how do we make something bigger and talk about food safety across the nation and, and share all the amount of information that we all have um, and sort of are using. The last one, and this is sort of the one that keeps me up at night, is um, COVID is having a huge impact on all of our performance, um, what we're doing, food uh, borne uh, attribution, uh, reporting, and all these different things. How are we going to explain this at the end of the day externally when someone's looking back at it next year? You know, the argument that that sort of keeps popping into my mind, well, you guys aren't doing all the inspections you guys always have done. And, you know, foodborne illness hasn't shot through the roof. Why is that? And that's, I know that's going to be a question we will get on the Hill and we're going to have to have an answer for it. And we do have good answers for that. Um, but these are the type of things we need to uh, really sort of think about now and collectively have the same answer and make sure that we're all together on sort of how we're answering it in the same terminologies and methodologies that we're doing it. And it's a good time to start discussing it now uh, because we, again, we will get asked those questions at the end of the day. Uh, with that, I am very excited to uh, look forward to the panel discussion. I'm sure you all will have lots more questions. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Eric. And uh, just to answer one of your questions, I was on a call recently with epidemiologists and laboratory people, and one of the things they said is all the epis have been basically moved over to COVID. And laboratory whole genome sequencing, they're basically doing COVID. So reporting right now is, is probably way down because they don't have people doing investigations and um, that could be an issue. And also you have a lot less people eating out of restaurants. So illnesses may be down since that's a major cause of illness. So just to help you with uh, one of the questions. Um, okay, our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Miller. She recently rejoined uh, uh, FDA in March of 2020 in her role as Assistant Commissioner for Medical Products and Tobacco Operations, Dr. Miller provides leadership and managerial direction to RRA's Office of Biologics, Biologics Products Operations, Office of Pharmaceutical Quality <clears throat> Operations, Office of Medical Device and Radiological Health Operations, the Office of Bio uh, Research, Monitoring Operations, and the Tobacco Operations Staff. So Dr. Mittler, uh, Miller uh, returns from the U.S. Pharmacopoeia, where she helped 
guide USP's working relationship with the FDA. At USP, Dr. Miller was vice president, US public uh, policy and regulatory affairs with responsibility to deliver executive leadership for developing and achieving USP's US regulatory science and intelligence, government affairs and public policy program goals. She also created strategic challenge uh, change focused on impacts and results from engagement with federal, state, and international regulators, as well as senior leadership in industry, academia, and patient-focused uh, alliances. Before rejoining USP in 2016, Dr. Miller began her federal career with FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research in 2007 in the Office of Unapproved Drugs and Labeling Compliance. She began her, began her CDER career working on online pharmacy and health fraud issues and ultimately served as the director for OUDLC's Division of Non-Prescription Drug uh, and Health Fraud. Dr. Miller holds a bachelor's degree in biology from John Hopkins and received her doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of Maryland. Dr. Miller? You're on mute. That we can't. There can you can hear me now. Yep, we can hear you now. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me. I am really thrilled to be here. Um, as you mentioned, I previously was at uh, USP about 12 weeks ago and recently rejoined FDA. I think I actually got to meet many of you in my role at USP um, as I did interface with AFTO um, in that capacity um, with respect to their work in foods and also some of their work with um, other regulated um, commodities. So thank you for having me and um, really appreciate um, the opportunity to speak at your virtual conference. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, like Eric, is I, I want to keep my remarks high level and brief because I think getting to the panel discussion is going to really bring the value in this um, uh, conference. And I, I wanted to really share sort of my message um, in my role as um, a head of medical products and tobacco operations that I'm really looking for opportunities to um, expand areas for collaboration. I think as FDA's ORA is in its third year of program alignment, a lot of really great things have happened, and um, we're really great, gaining great expertise. As you indicated, I mean, under medical products and tobacco, there are five different programs, and I think all of those programs are expanding in just unprecedented uh, ways with emerging technologies and advancements in um, different science areas, so it's really critical, I think, that we collaborate and work together in really addressing how, as these areas enter new um, uncharted territories, that we have the appropriate capacity to regulate them in a way that ensures American customers and consumers and patients have access to safe, effective, and high-quality products. So, I really am looking forward to how does ORA expand its relationship with AFTO in the areas of biologics, in the areas of medicine, in the area of devices, um, in the area of pharmacy compounding. So really looking for uh, mechanisms to do that so that we can leverage it, limited resources in ways that actually help us achieve our best public health impact. So, um, wanted to thank everybody for um, that and also, you know, thinking about how we can um, learn from each other. I think one of the things we've learned well in this time of COVID is we have to think about how we approach our really challenging public health problems in new and creative, innovative ways. And that is one thing I really value is, is approaching things from an innovative perspective. Um, cutting my teeth in health fraud in my previous time at FDA, I think it's really important that we look at um, other industries and other regulators and other commodities to see are there different tools that folks are using to approach public health problems in new and innovative ways? And how can we leverage um, artificial intelligence and, and other things to ensure that we are maybe doing things in the new, better way to achieve the outcomes that we really are hoping to achieve. 
So I think during you know these time we are utilizing authorities that we have gotten. Um, Michael talked about it earlier, you know, under 704A4. We do in the drug space have the um, authority to request records um, in advance or in lieu of inspection. And that is something we have been fully embracing and robustly utilizing as during this time when we're protecting our workforce and the workforce of those we regulate and actually modeling our behavior as public health officials to flatten the curve and, and to reduce unnecessary contact with um, folks that we don't need to come into contact with, that we are using this um, ability to, when we do need to do our mission critical assignments, um, we're able to focus our time in those facilities in a way that maximizes what we need to get to. But we're also utilizing our ability to make regulatory decisions by requesting those records. And I think as my colleagues Eric and Michael mentioned earlier, you know, continuing to um, move into this new phase of opening up in different states and locales, it's going to be important that as we pre-announce inspections, we get the right information about what capacity uh, different uh, regulated industries are operating at, the status within those facilities, and then if we are able to um, share the information around how do we collect the right materials even where we may not have the actual authority so that as a public health benefit to everybody, we are able to focus um, the time spent on site to get the best outcome that that is actually achievable. So um, with that, you know, I will move to talk a little bit about mutual recognition and in sort of the medical products and tobacco area, as Eric mentioned, when we talk about mutual recognition, we also often think of it in the international capacity. And we have been relying heavily on our international regulatory colleagues um, and work that they have done with regulated industry to inform our regulatory decisions as we are doing pre-approval inspections and getting that work accomplished. And again, I would like to really open the door to have conversations with members of AFTO on how do we expand that so that there's parity on a domestic perspective as well, so that we are actually utilizing all of our uh, resources and being good stewards in the best way we can to work and share information together. So I think with that, I just will talk a little bit about um, some of the things we are doing, um, as Michael indicated, as we are um, mainly focusing on those mission critical and poor cause inspections, we have been repurposing some of our resources to accomplish other things that are important at FDA right now. For example, um, working with our aligned centers and actually detailing folks to those centers to help with emergency use authorizations, um, to help as they are looking at um, authenticating things offered for import, particularly in the device space, and actually doing work with um, our health fraud teams, both in ORA, in our aligned centers, to ensure that folks don't take advantage of this um, really unfortunate time to um, defraud the American public with unsafe, ineffective, or poor quality stores. So in addition to that, we're also, as Michael indicated, um, finishing up any outstanding establishment inspection reports, as well as um, looking at our official establishment inventories to ensure that those information and data are as up to date as possible. Also, many of our public um, health service employees have been deployed and have been out um, doing mission critical and um, frontline work with our healthcare systems with um, the cruise ships in, in a very myriad of ways to really ensure that you know the government is providing an all hands response to the COVID-19 crisis and, and worldwide pandemic. And I think that is one of the one of the most um, just wonderful things about coming back to FDA for me is really seeing FDA doing what it does best, um, you know, pulling together in a crisis and and all hands on deck. So it's been a real strange time for me coming on board. Um, I, as Judy, uh, Dr. McNeekin indicated, was one of the first classes of um, new employee orientations where it was completely virtual. So I've been working from my home office um, during this entire rejoining time. And, um, you know, at 
the right time. I do look forward to going back into the office and uh, coming out and meeting you folks um, and having conversations about how we can continue our partnerships and collaborations. So I think with that, I will um, turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Our next speaker is uh, Dan Solis. He's currently uh, serving as Acting Assistant Commissioner for FDA's Office of Enforcement and Import Operations, a position he has held since March 29, 2020. In this role, he provides leadership, management, and direction to all field import divisions, including the Division of Food Defense Targeting and the Division of Import Operations. Management of this program includes activities related to imported FDA product investigation, examination, sample collection, detention, destruction, seizure, and import importer debarment. He serves as the agency focal point for headquarters field relationships and all import programs, operations, and provides subject matter expertise and direction for the development of import policies and new import procedures and regulations. He establishes field uniformity for import activities and coordinates agency import activities with U.S. Customs and Border Protection, including the development and institution of joint regulations, procedures, policies, and operations, as well as coordinating activities with other federal agencies and foreign governments with border responsibilities through interagency agreements, memorandum of understanding, and informal working relationships. Prior to his selection, Dan was the division director for the Division of West Coast Imports since February 2018, and he was the director of importer operations for Los Angeles District since 2009. Mr. Solis started his career with FDA in 1998 and has held many positions within the agency, such as microbiologist, compliance officer, branch director, and operational leadership roles in headquarters. Prior to working in FDA, Mr. Solis worked in the bioresearch field focusing on medical device and drug product development and applications. Mr. Solis holds a master's degree in healthcare administration from University of Laverne and a bachelor's degree from University of California at Irvine. Um, Dan? Yeah, thank, thank you, Julian. Uh, Dr. Julian, thanks for that intro. Just as a sound check, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, you're good. Thank, thank you again, AFTO uh, leadership, for having me here. And I think I know many of you, so familiar territory and familiar names that I see on the panelists. So thank you for uh, uh, bringing me back in. I, I don't want to take up too much anymore of your time, and I apologize for the long bio from myself and the other colleagues. Um, uh, I, I know that the heart of the matter here really is the Q&A. So I'll make my introduction about what OEIO does very, very short and sweet. Uh, really, I think. COVID-19, as my other colleagues have mentioned, really brought about a, a change in the way we approach things. We have to think outside of the box about how we do that, especially in the realm of supply chain. I think everyone can appreciate, especially in the realm of food and medical products, the supply chain and e-commerce, uh, we have to think about how do we address safety in, in those realms. And what we did um, constructively, and, and I think this is a, a testament to where the agency stands, and, in, in relation to uh, food and medical products is we're right smack in the middle with the other federal agencies that we deal with. Uh, we, we deal with customs and bar protection. And with that, what we did is we took a stance very similar to the Department of Homeland Security and that our activities that support was deemed essential. So we were there assuring that the food supply chain was safe, the medical products, the fraudulent products are out there were being stopped. And we continue to do that. And, and we're, we're glad to have played a role. At the same time, uh, we were trying to ensure our, our CSOs were safe, you know, um, practicing social distancing and, and all the parameters that CDC is, is telling us we were following that. So in that realm, we focused on that. And I know there's a, a couple of questions about e-commerce and then how we approach a, a lot of that. And, and, and we'll talk about that. But also in regards to federal and state relations, just for everyone's awareness, one of the things that we've been able to do in partnership with um, Mr. Mettler's group is we have partnership agreements out there that opened up the imports program. I, I think in, in the past, it's been mainly a, a food or medical product centric partnership agreement. What we're, we're doing now is we opened up, we know a lot more products are being manufactured overseas and coming into your states. So there's now as part of the partnership agreement, an imports program piece of that. So um, with that, I, I hand the floor back over to you, 
uh, Dr. Julian, so that we, we can open up on a Q&A piece that I think everyone's looking forward to. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, next is uh, Barbara Casson. She's the Director of the Office of Partnerships. In her role as Director of OP, she is responsible for the oversight, strategic planning, collaboration, and integration with our federal, state, and local partners for manufactured human and animal feet, animal food safety standards. Barbara began her career with FDA in 1990 as a field investigator with Pacific Region Cooperative Programs Director. Eventually, she became San, Francis San Francisco's District Director. Prior to joining FDA, she worked in the private sector for Nestle, Dole Packaged Foods, and John Labatt. Um, Ms. Cazins holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Iowa State University. She is active in the Western Association of Food and Drug Officials, WAFDO, the Association of Food and Drug Officials, the Institute of Food Technologists, and the International Association for Food Protection. Barbara? You may be on mute, Barbara. We're not hearing you yet, Barbara. Just figuring out how to get off mute, Ernie. Okay. Is it better? <laughs> no, hear you now. That's good. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for the membership for being there. And hi, everyone. I miss not seeing you. I don't have any prepared uh, talking points because I think Eric and Michael and Dan and everyone else covered it very, very well. Um, OP is here to support. We're here to help things happen and make things happen for our state, local, tribal, and territorial partners. And that's the um, overall goal of our office. So I think we have a lot of Q&As and I'm really gonna turn it back to Ernie, you and Steve. So let's start with the Q&A, let's interact. Well, Ernie, uh, I'll, I'll begin with a, a first question and I'm not sure who wants to take this, but. Um, the first question that I think um, I have is um, what lessons have we learned so far from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and how do you see COVID-19 changing how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Michael. We can hear you, Michael. I'll start. Um, you know, I mentioned a few opportunities um, that we now have as a result of COVID, and I think they will be with us. But I do think that we need more flexibility within our state contracts that might allow us to pivot to different areas um, in the event that we're not able to physically get to some of these locations. Um, I mentioned the new tool remote regulatory assessments and program evaluations. Um, but if you think about what is possible as it relates to data, not only data that we generate about what we do, um, Eric talked about the widgets, um, I, I talked about the use of the new pool as well as non-contract inspections. Um, but if you think about data that firms generate, um, you know, this might be an opportunity looking forward to be able to understand and tap into those data sets when a firm, for example, has their own environmental testing program or in lieu of an inspection again, um, looking at some portal that might um, allow us to review a food safety plan. You know, as you know, when we wrote that out, we said we would not just collect them um, during inspections, but we would collect them to support observations. Um, but, you know, looking at different platforms to look at data, review data remotely, have a real-time assessment and understanding of um, what firms are, are, are doing from a manufacturing perspective. Um, it certainly is, is a lesson learned um, going forward. Uh, you know, and, I, I, and as I mentioned, I, there was no script for this, but I do think that we will learn um, and have some lessons learned moving forward. Another I can think of is, um, and we were trying to customize the RFR process. There is no provision that we have that requires or creates an avenue for a firm to tell us when they've reduced their operations or closed. That's important to know for firms that are part of a critical infrastructure. And we actually talked about maybe we can modify the reportable food registry or it's an avenue or this, just to know that a firm might be operating at 
30% capacity. So I do think that um, <clears throat> when things return to whatever the new normal is, FDA and our state regulators and industry um, and other interested partners should sit down and talk about um, collectively what are some opportunities that were surfaced as a result of COVID that we might have the opportunity to take advantage of um, that might help us do our job in, in a, a non-traditional way moving forward. Recognizing again, of course, um, inspections and investigations and sample collections are not overrated, but they shouldn't be um, the only tool and, and there are other means of, of assessing a firm's, the industry's compliance. But my, my colleagues may, may want to add to that answer. So Michael, the thing, the thing I'll add is really um, around culture and food safety culture. I think there's a tremendous opportunity here uh, with everyone, you know, understanding pathogens a little bit more with COVID and, and these pieces of it, specifically, and I think everyone realizes it, it's the hand washing, right? Um, that's uh, one of the biggest contributors to foodborne illness is just not washing your hands properly. So the question that I have, and I think it's an opportunity as well, is one, if health and these hand washing activities and things of this nature are taking hold now, you know, how do we maintain that? Alternatively, those folks that still aren't doing these practices, it, you know, it might be an opportunity to try to get with them and understand still why they didn't um, do these practices. Again, after COVID stops, we really want to continue this practice of, you know, safe and hygienic practices at the end of the day. This is a very good test case scenario to understand why people didn't, why they didn't. Um, I'm personally very interested in the why they didn't aspect, especially with the severity of COVID. We can't convince them to wash their hands um, during a pandemic like this. I'm, it's going to be very hard for us to do it from a food safety standpoint. So I think there's a lot of areas, as Michael said, as lessons learned that we can look back at this as if we're starting to capture the right data now. Um, and as Michael said, I think other interesting parts is just sort of how do we do our day-to-day -day activities. And since we are doing things a little bit differently, can we extend that into the future? What does that future look like? Very good. So uh, I'm going to go to a question from the audience next, Ernie, um, and th this question is, as e-commerce expands, we are seeing an uptick in uh, the number of states considering mandated um, some sort of regulation on site selling um, packaged goods. Uh, we were just looking for any insights from FDA on uh, how do we regulate the Internet successfully in this new world um, where we have so many um, sales happening over the Internet? Okay. And I don't know who gets that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you want me to take the first stab at that, uh, my colleagues. But on on the international front, uh, I I will share that uh, we have uh, s several uh, units within ORA that's looking actively at at fraud and also internet sales. We have the Office of Criminal Investigations as well as the Health Fraud Branch, and OEIO has been uh, joining up with a lot of task forces out there with the uh, Department of Homeland Security and FBI and looking at uh, a lot of the price gouging aspects of this. Um, I think Dr. Miller touched on this uh, condition that we're, we're in with the COVID-19 pandemic that people are taking advantage of it. And that, that's the same way with e-commerce and you ordering online. So we have to monitor that. Um, I think the messages were already sent out there that FDA is not alone in this, that we, we're gonna rely on each other and especially with legitimate trade. I, I can share with you with some of the states, they needed input from FDA on legitimate ventilators and PPEs and whether they were registered with FDA. So in that regard, it was a strong partnership, not only in electronic commerce, but, but also you know the practical shipment from the government to government exchange. We were right there uh, communicating uh, with the states in that regard. And this is Judy, I would just also say that, you know, I think that um, sort of catapulted us into this, where the new era of smarter food safety will, will take us and, and what does that look like? And um, what does a successful e-commerce um, look like? And so I, I think the, the new era of smarter food safety will, will help um, involve, you know, you as, uh, at, you know, APTO and, 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 and regulators, so more to come on that. 
We have uh, another question from the audience, and the question from the audience is, um, we heard a lot about uh, expanded cooperation and sharing of information between uh, regulatory partners. How does this uh, relate to um, what we've seen in the tightening of the restrictions of sharing information under credentialing and 2088 agreements? Eric, I'll let you answer that, that's your area. No, 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 absolutely. And I think this is one of the things that we are looking into um, right now. As I stated, you know, as we're moving forward with Mutual Alliance, we're trying to figure out what the right balance is um, with uh, disclosures. And that's sort of a big piece from our standpoint, you know, what we can disclose and we can based on federal uh, regulations. In that space, there are specific requirements, um, whether you're under a grant or a contract, if you're credentialed. Um, and then also, to be very honest, the state sunshine laws and sort of how we go about navigating those. And it is going to be, uh, unfortunately, at this point, it's really, you know, working with each individual state, trying to figure out what type of information you need and how we can get it to you as quickly as possible. Um, I can commit that we are going to try, you know, every means possible that we can get the information to you. It just may take some time. And as we are shifting from um, contracts to grants and a variety of other mechanisms, there's a few different little um, aspects of each one that might change or may appear uh, externally to change um, how we can share the information with you. Uh, it is not our intention to not share information with you. That goes against everything that we are doing and talking about right here. Um, but it, I, I think we, we are going to uh, see a little bit of changes here and there, but it's that overall goal um, through a variety of different means to get you that information at the end of the day. Uh, Barbara, I'm not sure if you want to sort of expand upon that at all on the very specifics of a contract versus a grant. Double muted again. I, th I think you did a great job of covering it. I believe what you can see, um, our partners can see coming forward is we're going to have some additional training around this. We're going to talk about the differences between contracts and grants, 2088 commissions, credentials. We're going to go over it one more time. But as Eric mentioned, we're looking to make at roads and avenues to changing those regulations so we can share broadly. Okay, um, let's move on to a, the next question. Um, the next question that we received from uh, one of our participants was, uh, you mentioned the new re uh, remote regulatory assessments, Eric, and uh, professional evaluations, which sounds a little like the GFSI and other third-party audits. In addition to this, does this new work have any connection with the USDA FDA codex work on the CCFICS discussion on third-party audits? I'm not sure I missed that's Michael. So I'll, I'll take the first part of that, Steve. Um, it, 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 I don't think it relates to those programs. It may be similar to them, but again, um, it's a new tool that we anticipate using as regulators between FDA and the states, um, that being remote regulatory assessments and program evaluations. Um, I mentioned that some programs within FDA have the regulatory authority to request records in advance of an inspection, and some don't. Um, we, we're, we're looking um, to, to expand that authority, but if we don't get it, it will be a voluntary program. Um, but if you think about it, there are records that firms could provide in advance of an inspection that might obviate our need to go there. But if you also think about the role that our audits program has for states trying to achieve full conformance with the manufactured food regulatory program standards, the animal feed regulatory program, the program does with the states on training and oversight of the inspections in retail milk and shellfish, there are records that can be provided in advance of those. And that's why we've added program evaluation. Um, ideally, we would want to socialize that approach, um, define when it is appropriate to request records in lieu of these inspections or to streamline them, as well as these program evaluations. I talked about um, the creation of a new operations code so that we can quantify when this new tool was used and um, describe the impact. Um, I don't know that it would, would, would take the place of an audit, um, especially an audit that a firm had self-imposed on themselves. So if they then provided up records in lieu of an inspection of the streamline, would that suffice for something they, they, they were um, going to be engaging in as it relates to an audit. I don't, I don't know that those two programs um, 
uh, are, are related, but my, my colleagues may want to comment on that. Um, Matthew, you any comments? So I'll ask one more question here. Um, and this one uh, is, um, how has uh, FDA and AFTO leadership uh, engaged with the state and local public health departments and other groups such as NATO, NEHA, AFTO, and others during the last 15 weeks? Well, I'll start with FDA. I'm not sure if this is an Eric or Barbara question or a Michael question, but uh, we'll start with FDA. Yeah, I'll, I'll just kick it to Barbara right away since she's the key um, aspect of that and sort of the day-to-day -day, um, interactions between those. Um, Barbara, do you want to take it? Sure. Sure, and Barbara's getting better at double meeting and getting off of this. Um, just to <laughs> let you know, my colleague, uh, Jeff Fair and I, um, Jeff is over in Office of Foods, and um, he and I have been meeting with the associations, our key associations, ASFO, NASA, um, APHL, of course, AFTO, um, NACHO, NEHA, on a monthly basis. Brenda Stewart Munoz sets up those meetings. We just talk about you know, what are current things we want to do? What are issues bubbling up? What do we need to be thinking about? Really forward leaning. And then in my role as um, Partnership for Food Protection co-chair, we are going to start a series of um, webinars, one being tomorrow, about lessons learned and applied from COVID. What did we, we learn from laboratory side of defense? What did we learn on the retail side? So we're planning to host about five different webinars very target target to specific subject matter, but to start discussing those things. And we're doing that as co-sponsored with our associations. So I think we're becoming more and more actively engaged and always looking for new opportunities from people who have ideas of what we could do better. Well, uh, let's move on to another question. And this one appears to, uh, I think they specifically addressed it to Eric. Um, and Eric, you mentioned uh, the congressional questions regarding the change of focus and field activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. What are the other big changes that we've seen over time is the distrust of government officials and backlash from public health officials. Has the agency discussed how this will affect the future relationship of the industry, the public, and lawmakers? And any thoughts about uh, how do we deal with this going forward? Um, well, I think in general, it really goes back to the, the concept of the integrated um, food safety system. And, and we all know that that is just more than the regulators. It's more than just FDA. It's more than the states and the locals on uh, tribal territorial. It really starts integrating industry, academia, um, and others and the legislators. And so I think the key part about this is to really sort of keep that dialogue going, um, be transparent with what we're doing, and showing the return on investment at the end of the day, telling those stories, make it tangible for folks. So for example, during the COVID time, we should all be telling a story about the impacts it's had on sort of our individual areas um, and food safety as a whole. And what lessons learned we have, have it, such as Barbara is talking about. And then sort of take that and make it tangible and digestible for folks at the end of the day. Um, we will not achieve the We're losing your system in the direction. I think a lot of this is culture change, um, both within inside the agency at FDA, we are working on that now. Um, but it's gonna take time across the board on both ourselves. Um, but I think a big part of it is education, transparency, and making sure that we really show the return on investment at the end of the day. Oh. Another question that has been a common question we've been hearing about is training. Um, most of our training, uh, other than some online courses, has been in person, and we've been going through a dramatic switch to uh, virtual training over the last uh, several months, or last few months. Um, the question is, does FDA have an idea of the long-term solution for training? Um, is it more virtual, all virtual, or a combination of virtual and person? Any thoughts on where training is headed? This is Judy, and I can take uh, some of that. Um, rest assured, we are committed to moving in the direction, you know, beyond merely just responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. We do have to, we are committed to updating our learning management system to a more modern system capable of offering computer-based and virtual instructor-led models um, and access to the training materials. But we do have to keep in mind um, travel restrictions as they are, you know, we are still in the midst of a pandemic with some increasing um, 
you know, uh, infections uh, occurring at this time. So I think it's going to, you know, from a longer term perspective, the training for FDA and states, local, tribal, will be a blended learning approach of virtual, online, computer-based training in classroom, wherever appropriate. But ultimately, the goal is to maximize the available training options and the corresponding technology. Um, the next question that we'll, we'll hit on for a second is, um, of course, last, uh, the last two years we've had a lot of uh, outbreaks related to romaine and other leafy greens in Yuma uh, and California. Any thoughts on what's happening there and uh, what we're doing to, uh, to stop those outbreaks in the future? Michael? Sir, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I'm figuring out the mute like Barbara. Um, so, so you're, you're aware of the Leafy Green Action Plan, and we've began, begun to, to socialize the root cause investigations that the agency publishes when there is a major outbreak. Um, a lot of those efforts stress, though, the responsibility that industry has to adopt practices that, that promote um, produce that is safe to consume. Um, a lot of those root cause investigations have highlighted um, practices associated with the use of land and the proximity of cattle to crops. Um, buyers and, and the industry, um, you know, are certainly going to be looking at some of those findings. Um, in the future, we do have a longitudinal study that we're promoting um, an opportunity for industry as, as and growers as, as well as regulators to participate in that look at some of the root cause and perhaps influence some industry practices. But, um, you know, this is a problem. Um, you know, we continue to have foodborne outbreaks associated with certain types of products in certain areas. And uh, that's unacceptable. Um, you know, I, and we're, we're all consumers. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it certainly puts a lot of people at risk. I, say, I, I can say, though, it's encouraging that um, as an example of industry adjusting its practices, many of you will recall around Thanksgiving a couple of years ago, the agency, because of lack of traceability, um, essentially advised American consumers not to consume any romaine lettuce. Um, subsequent to that, another outbreak, unfortunately, but we did have labeling on packages that allowed us to advise consumers about romaine lettuce from a specific area. And that was an industry change that um, allowed us to take advantage not only of our knowledge of the growing seasons, but um, uh, industry adopting package labeling to indicate um, where product was actually grown, but certainly more work is, should be done in, in those areas, and, and we've, we've got to get better as regulators and, and industry. Okay, I, I see w one more question from the audience that we're gonna, uh, going to go forward with, and the question is, does the panel have any comments on PPE, uh, PPE that should be used during a food safety inspection in COVID-19? Uh, and the, they continue, I'm not sure just the face covering is adequate. Any thoughts from the panel? Michael, do you want to discuss so, the, what we're doing with CDC? So we've been working with CDC on a public health inspector fact sheet that we've, we've commented on and it's in the clearance process. Um, it does describe um, what some would call PPE, but it's really um, face coverings and gloves, but also suggestions um, about what employers can do, as well as um, some additional precautions that um, public health inspectors should consider. Um, that document also addresses, quite rightly, the need for those conducting work at facilities to understand what those facilities have implemented that fall under that safety and precautions umbrella. You know, we have seen that um, certain manufacturers, certain industries um, have, have had and are dealing with um, outbreaks within their facilities and others aren't. And so, um, you know, as time passes, we're learning more about COVID-19 and ways to protect ourselves 
against it. I can tell you that, and we alluded to this earlier, we are having discussions um, about the resumption of routine domestic inspections. Um, but as part of those discussions, we continue um, to, to, to focus on the safety of our workforce and the safety of industry's workforce. And those issues will certainly be what we'll consider. We're trying again, though, to circle back to get that um, uh, uh, fact sheet, which was developed by CDC and NIOSH, a public health inspector fact sheet. And it does explain um, certain precautions that um, individuals and employers, i.e. regulators, should take into account when they send their staff on, on those front lines to do those um, inspections or, or program assessments. Well, to close out our panel today, I'm going to ask you all one last question. And uh, we've talked a lot about uh, an integrated food safety and integrated regulatory system uh, today. And I would just like each panelist to comment a little bit about what, do you, what would be the biggest contributions we could make to advancing that system forward in the future. I, this is Judy. I, I, I think the biggest uh, advancement is really just continuing to leverage the relationships that we have and the collaboration that we have um, and to, 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 to hone in and focus on the unique skills that we bring to the table to all for the better of protecting public health um, and to be integrated. That's what I would, my response would be. Yeah, this is Michael. I'll add, I, I do think that, I agree, and I do think that we need to take advantage of the data that already exists. Um, as an integrated food safety system, the inspections that we, the regulators, conduct need to be focused on risk and not necessarily um, inspection frequency mandates. Um, and, and, and I think that's what industry expects. Um, and so, you know, working together as co-regulators, um, I, I do think that, that, that we can use the data um, that would allow us to target our resources um, at, at, in the right areas, um, focusing on riskier products and firms, um, and, and, and in some cases, um, going outside of the, the um, inspection frequency mandate um, in a way that would allow us to repurpose those resources in, in areas where, where they're more needed. This is Dan Solis, I'll just quickly add in the realm of IT technology, I think we have an opportunity there in leveraging uh, current technology out there in terms of data, as, as Michael and, and Dr. McNeekin talked about. On, on the import side, it really does benefit if we have a lot of this pre-arrival information in the world of, you're, you're hearing it right now, there's a lot of firms out there leveraging blockchain technology and AI. And I think uh, we're in the space now where because of COVID-19, we can uh, take some of that data and pre-arrival information and expedite compliant shipments that come into the United States. Hi, Elizabeth. I think I'll just add on to some of the themes and, and that really is to be laser focused on what the public health outcomes are that we are trying to achieve and using really innovative out of the box solutions to achieve those working as partners. I think it's really important that we do make risk-informed decisions and that, you know, as good stewards of limited resources, we work together in whatever ways we can, but also, like, make sure that we're really thinking outside the box and utilizing new technologies and new tools, um, even though it hasn't been done before, being open-minded to thinking about ways to achieve what we need to achieve using whatever is at our disposal. So this is Eric, I'll just add on top of that. Um, the one piece that I really see is we are doing a lot of great work already um, and we will continue to do great, great work. What we really need to do is celebrate those um, opportunities that we have successes in and make sure that everyone outside knows and understands this. We need to sell the reasons why we're doing it. We need to show people that great things have happened and can continue to happen. So again, it's just a lot of education and promoting um, and celebrating what we've done already. That's great, Eric. And if I could just add on to that, because people have heard from me about this before. For the regulators on the line, public health workers, think about, think one workforce. Think about every day how you can communicate locally with the federal, the state, the local agencies, your peers, 
and have that open dialogue, that open communication. We need to establish trust and we need to build an interconnected system. And I'd love to see us get there fully, but I think Eric's right. We need to promote those successes that we've had thus far. Well, we'd like to thank this whole panel for their participation. We know this took a great part of your day and your willingness to try a virtual conference. Uh, we're doing pretty well, though. We're at 742 participants yet this afternoon. That's a great sign and a very, uh, very good commitment from individuals to participate.